All right, we have a live audience at the West China Tea House. How cool is this, everybody? This is awesome. Uh, thank you all so much for coming to the first ever live recording of Tea Time with Jesse. I'm here with a, a very gracious host who is not only here as a host on the channel as a guest, but also this is your tea house, West China Tea House. Welcome, Sohan. Hey. Very cool. Uh, so for people on the internet that may not know you or anybody in the audience that may not know you, give us a little bit of a 30-second uh, introduction. Who are you? What do you do? Great. My name's Sohan Phan. I'm the founder of West China Tea, where we are now. I, we import Farm Direct Tea and Artisan Teaware, like Jesse, and uh, I lived in China for several years as well and source a lot of these teas myself. And yeah, we've had this tea house since, in this location since 2017, started the company 10 years ago now. And, We've just been building the tea community here in Austin That's and great. also on our website online at westchinatea.com and a bunch of other stuff, Instagram, TikTok, et cetera. Et cetera. That's great. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, as like Chinese tea, as everybody knows, and like I think we're definitely at the state. Uh, it almost feels like the very early days of the comedy scene in China where there were only like 20 comedians. Mm -hmm. So like I was like, anybody doing any comedy show is good for comedy in China. Anybody doing any sort of tea thing is good for tea in the States. And so uh, it's definitely one of those cases where I'm glad to be able to have some other, you know, tea people, Charin, that are here mm -hmm. in the States. So uh, for basically what we do on the podcast, we just kind of sit and talk and chat about stuff that is fun. And for me, as somebody that spent nine years in Beijing, uh, to talk with other people that have spent time in China and lived in China, that's always a, a, like a good reminiscence. So mm -hmm. where did you live in China and then uh, what did you do when you were there? So I lived in Chengdu, the capital of Sichuan province, the capital of Western China, they call themselves, uh, home of the giant panda slash chest hair. But yeah. um, <laughs> guys, call back to the part, or, or part yeah, of this. Yeah, call back to the callback. Oh. <laughs> yeah. no. uh, and I was doing, actually I was doing limnological research there. I, my, I made her do what, what, uh, yeah, wait, wait, wait. So I know I'm, a lot of words, but <laughs> I, that was not one of the words I knew. What was so, it? so you know marine biology? Yeah. Limnology is the exact same thing, but without salt. So, so freshwater biology. So like, yeah, so like no salt. No salt. No salt. Yeah, very okay. little salt. No yeah. soy and sauce. So, no, no soy anything. sauce. No. Yeah, low sodium. Low sodium low marine sodium. biology, basically. OK, yeah. all right. I think that. Other <laughs> scientists also don't know what it is, so don't feel bad. I'll I was like, like, I was a little bit like, you know, <laughs> of, like there's like some comedians who are like, Ooh. I'm like, I actually didn't know the word. <laughs> I felt like I should have known the word. Okay, limnology? Limnology, freshwater biology, ecology, basically, we were trying to clean up the Funan River, which is this big, oh, yeah. the Min River, which flows right through the, um, the yeah. middle of Chengdu, down off the Tibetan Plateau. That'll it's be a lot polluted. of work. It's a lot of work, yeah, and so we've been working hard uh, with my organization that I work for called Kira, the Chengdu Urban Rivers Association. Hmm. They've been around in one form or another since like 1990, trying hmm. to grapple with this freshwater pollution problem. And then, I was just living there, doing my life, and I already liked tea. I'd been into Gongfu Cha for about seven years when I moved there. Oh, so you knew about Chinese tea before you went there? Well, I grew up drinking Chinese tea because my dad's from Hong Kong. Yeah. So I grew up drinking Puar and Tie Guan Yin and Mo Li Hua Cha and yeah. all these different types of tea when we'd go get dim sum, which yeah. was my only contact with Chinese culture growing up pretty much, was going mm. to eat Chinese food. Mm. And I remember really liking the tea as a kid growing up and then getting into Gongfu Cha as an adult and learning the Mandarin names for these, I had no idea that I had been drinking puar my whole life because mm. they call it bole cha in Cantonese. Oh, yeah. Completely different sounding, yeah. completely different. And so uh, I didn't even realize that I'd been drinking a lot of these teas that I got so, into. So you kind of had a little bit of a background before. Yeah, yeah. I'd yeah. actually even worked at a tea house before I moved to China. I worked wow. at Jade Leaves Tea House, which is now defunct, mm. but uh, a great place to work. My first getting my feet wet in the tea industry, being a tea server at this tea house. and. Um, yeah, when I moved there, I was excited. I, one of the reasons why I chose Chengdu is because there are three things it's famous for is uh, good tea, good food, beautiful women, and, you know. Good place. Yeah, exactly. Good so place. I was, you know, I was a much younger person. Chengdu so. is actually a great place. It's, it's, I've been there on traveling, but it was definitely one of those places where I was like, this would be a good place to live. Oh, yeah. Like, it's also like, it's funny, it's, it's not a small city at all. But the pace of life is a little bit better than Beijing or Shanghai, so it's like a nice place to live. So. Like the giant panda itself. Exactly, yes. like the giant the panda. The Chengdu people are like the giant panda. I so so you found yourself in Chengdu, and I know that you like white tea, so the first tea that I picked uh, to make for you is this 2017 uh, Da Hao uh, Bai Lu Bai Cha, White Dew White Tea. Um, this, is, uh, this is definitely one of my favorite types of tea. Like anybody who's... Uh, gone to my shop before knows that as like you I also love the fooding white teas the uh, fooding white teas are amongst the best 
and uh, 2017 with the age, uh, it makes it a little bit more, uh, like kind of get that herbal flavor coming out of it, which is what I really like about the white tea. We just filmed a, another video, which I don't know if it's gonna be up by the time this airs, but uh, you were talking about how white tea is kind of your go-to tea to make if you don't know if the people who are make, like, who are you're making tea for like it? Yeah. Is that absolutely. the thing? Yeah, I just find that if I've got a, like I'm serving tea at like a party and there's like 20 people sitting there, I don't have time to ask people what they like or yeah. get any information. I'll just make aged white tea because yes. everybody likes it pretty much every time. Mm -hmm. So this is good. And, and uh, about, this, uh, about this age is kind of where I feel like everything is, is going well. I've heard it a couple times over here at the tea house, but they have that, that saying that, which is uh, one, one year is good tea, uh, three years is medicine, and seven years is a treasure. So if anybody's been here to the tea house, I bet you've heard that before. It's a very good, uh, very good saying. Um, the first steep of the white teas, usually I wash it because we get into the better flavors a little bit quicker, but you know, the smell there, you know, the good aginess. And it's actually, this will be interesting because usually the people that I have on the show are not tea people. So they're always like, oh, it's good. But then they, <laughs> they don't have, the, they don't say very much else over that. But, um, but you're actually a tea person. So if you'd like to pour, you can pour on Chonky Horse. Chonky Horse. Chonky Horse is a unit. Look at this guy. <laughs> it was funny. One of the people in the audience is like followed online and saw Chonky Horse and he's like, oh, He's bigger in person. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, whoa, like, you know, like, this is like a tea pet, like, you know, it's like tea pet celebrity. <laughs> um, so we'll make over here. What, what, what's his Chinese name? Pang Pang Ma? Oh, oh, you know, I should have, um, how do you say chonk in Chinese? <laughs> He's like Peng Zai or something <laughs> like that. I don't know why I want to go in. Xiao Peng Zi. Yeah, yeah. I had a friend whose nickname was Xiao Peng Zi, little yeah. fatty. Little in fatty. In China. <laughs> and that's just cool. This in is China, what they say. People, I'll, I'll go back to China and my friends will be like, oh, you got fatter. Yeah, and yeah. It's just like, it's not an insult there. They're just like, oh, your body has changed. Yeah. You're bigger now. That's, that's why I had a joke. I was away from China for three years. I came back. I did a, a, one of the jokes I came up with real fast when I was uh, adjusting back. And I did it uh, in the clubs as soon as I got back in. I was like, I was away for three years and I can tell who my real friends are. Cause like the people I know who are like friendly to me, they'll be like, oh, it's been years, I miss you. And then my real friends are like, you got fat. <laughs> like, <laughs> like straight up. And I'm like, Paula. I'm like, hey, treasure will Paula. Hey, 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 hey. So here we go. Enjoying the white tea. That's for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers. Thanks for having Cheers. me to Austin. Absolutely. Mm. Oh, yeah. It's good. What do we think? Delicious, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's a very... little apricot note. Mm. I like, he has better adjectives than me. I like it. And we just came off drinking another white tea. Yeah, so yeah. So we're just so two white teas. We're just, tea. we're, we're, a lot of tea today. we're deep in there. You might want to play this at 0.8x when it's on YouTube, because we're, we're yeah, very exactly. halfway already. Yeah, how do I get this thing to... You might have to rotate it a little bit. I have to rotate yeah. it. Rotate again, it E3. until it no longer displays Sangaba. There you go. Okay, is it now, good? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Okay, very good. He's got the real, like, high-tech Chinese tea boiling equipment here, which I love. So uh, back to our conversation. So uh, what was, like, the best part about living in Chengdu? Oh, man. Uh, I loved it. Everything. I would just wake up and just be like, what a glorious day. There's <laughs> trash burning on the street. And I'm just, like, walking through the smoke of this trash. I'm like, I love Chengdu. <laughs> and, you know, I think... Um, I mean, obviously, the three things that I said that were good are, in fact, really, really great about Chengdu. Um, the, the pace of life, like you said, there, there's more tea houses in Chengdu than there are in Shanghai. And really? Shanghai is way bigger than Chengdu, yeah. many times bigger than Chengdu. Well, not but, even per capita, just more of them. There's more of them oh, wow. just straight, you know, numerically, there's more tea houses in Chengdu than in Shanghai. And that's something I love about Chengdu is that they're really down to slow down and just enjoy their yeah. lives. And also... I don't know, I'm, I'm more curious what your experience was. Mm. I found that in Chengdu, and maybe in China in general, things mm. that are way more difficult than they really need to be here are not as difficult in mm. China, such as like, I don't know, like I got a motorcycle when yeah. I was living in China, and it was like $400 cash. Yeah. I didn't have a driver's license in yeah. China, but no. they didn't care. They didn't I care. rode it off the lot. I'd never ridden a motorcycle yeah. before. They didn't care. I rode it off the lot, you know? They're like, I remember that when I was getting uh, my first e-bike, I had an electric motorcycle. And the first one I got, um, which was just like a little dinky, you know, whatever, a little mini one, 
I asked the guy at the front, I was like, how much it cost? He's like, oh, it was, I think it was 2,000 Kwai, which is like 300 bucks. <laughs> and um, you know, I, I, I give him the money in cash. He gives me the keys. I'm like, are we done? He's like, he like looked at me like I was weird. It's like, are we not done? <laughs> like, like, what do you want me to do for you, man? Like, you know, you have the keys. And I'm like, do we need any, do we need plates? And then he like, he like thought a moment, no. Nah. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, that's, that's good. And the second bike I had, which was, you know, the statute of limitations, almost surely illegal. Um, but I had friends who were at the Tsinghua University Electrical Engineering School. And so what they would do, they had, a, they had an e-bike club that what they did was they would basically like create these like Franken bikes from parts and then electrical engineer them together and then they would ride them for like three weeks until they got bored and then they would sell it basically for parts to buy the next one. Huh. And I managed to get this like monster bike that like it went 70 miles an hour. It was like, <laughs> it was like, this is why I say like they didn't require a license. And I, I asked about this and I asked the guy, I was like, so what are the laws on this? He's like, the law is you, uh, the bike can't be intended to drive more than 25 miles an hour. Do you intend to drive this bike faster than 25 miles an hour? I'm like, I don't even know what I'm gonna do tomorrow. I don't know. <laughs> and so it was, it was real loose there. So like, it is weird how like some of the stuff that um, here is like very, you know, we think of China as a bureaucracy, but like there's a lot of stuff here that is like very bureaucratic and over there is not a problem. Yeah. And then um, especially in Chengdu, they have that saying, the, uh, you know, the, the mountains are high and the emperor is far away. Uh, yeah. uh, so in Beijing, we would often be the first ones to have like, you know, they do have plates for electric bikes now, but Chengdu is probably Wild West. Literally, oh, yeah. literally, literally Wild, wild I was, West. I would call it that when I lived there. It's like we're the Wild West. And, and I, I, you know, motorcycles are, were in fact something that you need a license. And I didn't have a license or a license plate. And also my motorcycle was illegally large. Mm. It was too big for, you need a Ru Cheng Zheng uh, entering the city license for motorcycles because they're considered uncivilized. Mm. And so uh, they're not wenming enough. And Chengdu wanted to be so wenming when yeah, I was yeah. living there. They were trying to Very overcome similar. this, this reputation Ooh, as being kind of backwater. And mm. so they were, didn't like motorcycles. So I was illegal in four different ways. Mm. And did you ever get pulled over? I got pulled over once. It was funny. I lived in Beijing eight and a half years, never got pulled over. I lived in Shanghai six months. I got pulled over once. And the, the, uh, the, the cop was like, you were over the speed limit. And I was like, there's a speed limit. <laughs> I, like, I, did, I literally didn't know. And I actually did this joke in theaters in Shanghai the day after this happened to me. I was like, he said it was over the speed limit. I'm like, eh, guess, guess what the speed limit is. And like people would yell out, they're like, you know, 20 kilometers an hour, 40, 60, whatever. Like nobody in the audience knew what the speed limit <laughs> was either. Um, uh, so they have that phrase, I said, you know, whatever the, um, <laughs> like, they, like, they have a phrase, the actual phrase is, <laughs> which is the, the, the ones above have the rules and the ones below have their way of going about things. And so my joke was, I would say, the ones above have the rules and the ones below didn't even know. Like, like, <laughs> So like that would be um, that would definitely be one of those jokes that it was like you know I was, I was happy about that it happened in real life and then <laughs> he um, I got a fine on the street he was like uh, he's like I have to fine you I'm like what's the fine he's like thirty kwai which is six dollars uh. so I was like okay fine like you know and I realized it's Shanghai like I don't carry cash on me in China and I was like I don't have any cash and he's like I'll scan you <laughs> <laughs> and he pulled out WeChat and he just scanned my WeChat at the same time yeah. And then afterwards, I got a little bit greedy, and I was like, "You had a receipt for that?" And he goes, "In China, if you get the receipt, you can you can put that against your taxes, and you pay less taxes if you have the receipts." And he he took out three ten kwai receipts and gave them to me, wow. and I I was able to to uh, you know lessen my tax burden by six dollars, uh, which was um, you know these things that seemed important at the time. Then I come back to America, and it's like a candy bar is eight dollars. <laughs> You know, it's funny, I just always pretended I couldn't speak Chinese when I got pulled over. Oh, did, did that work for you? It worked twice out of three times. Really? Yeah, where the third guy could speak English. Really? Uh, yeah, but it worked twice out of three, and to the point where they would just get so exasperated that they would just let me go. Because you look Asian, so I assume they wouldn't believe it. If I, oh, Ting Budong, I couldn't yeah. get away with it. Yeah. Uh, but I, I never did that. I was like, everybody's always like, that's the way you get out of them. Like, I studied Chinese so long, I just... I just couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. I just like would, like refused to do it, and it was it was honestly I felt like half the time they wanted me to do that because mm -hmm. they didn't want to like oh this guy is like you know cognizant I have to <laughs> go through the the whole thing <laughs> and like you know they I felt like they didn't really want to do that. So anyway, based off of this, it sounds like you spent most of your time in Chengdu running from the police. 
Just what Mostly, I yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, actually, we, I did, uh, one time I had uh, two people on my motorcycle in the city, which you're not supposed to do, and I had a cop chasing us, and he actually was trying to grab the back of the motorcycle, and we like, were down in like, the little alleys, and I was like running from this cop <laughs> with two people on the back, two full-grown adults on the back of my little 150cc motorcycle. Like, and we hit and the guy like, like, next to your ear is like, da na 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 Yeah, and there was one part where he actually had to grab the, the back of my motorcycle, and I pulled away fast enough that he had to let go, and then he was chasing us on foot, and we like, hid inside a little mechanics garage, and like, pulled, I don't know whose it was, it was just no one was there. I pulled the shutter down and we like hid behind there until we heard him go past. Uh, yeah, it was great. You know, like I would like, never do that in China. You do that in China, you do that in America, you end up dead. Yeah, yeah, you, you so, get shot. Yeah. Um, so yeah, was that a police or the Chungwan? I don't know if they had Chungwan. That was a that was a that was a cop. Oh, a police. That was a cop. In, in China, they have the actual police, and then they have this group of people that are Chungwan, which are like the city, you know, enforcers who are like not actual police. You could think of them as like, if you went to college, like the campus police, they think they're police, they're not really police. Mm -hmm. um, and, and like, you know, there were just like different rules because like everybody would listen to the police there, but then like, if you were like selling books on the street and the Chungwan came around, they literally just scoop it up and run. Yeah. And then um, there were like different rules, so. Uh, it's crazy, so anyway, so you were in Chengdu, mm -hmm. um, and then I seem to remember you told me a story that you were a, uh, musician and performer in oh, Chengdu yeah. did this. Yeah. Do you guys know this? That he did uh, he did music in China. Tell Nate, him what was Nate your stage. What, what was your stage name? Well, I'll, I'll give a little background. Okay. Was, so, yeah. I, you know, if you're a foreigner, I don't know how it is now, but back when I was living in China, if you're a foreigner in China, you can get paid to perform doing whatever, and they don't care if you are good at doing that thing at all. They mm. just want you to be a foreigner on stage. Mm. And so I had all these friends who made a living being professional lao wai, yeah. based mm -hmm. professional foreigners, yeah. going and being at a party and just talking to people, or pretending to be a doctor, or for an advertisement, <laughs> or, um, or playing music. Yeah. And they, you know, they are not, and they'll, you show up at a gig and they're like, uh, you, you, and you, you're a band now. Yeah. We've never met each other, but you're a band now. Go sing Hotel California. And so they love hotel and, and country roads. They love, they oh, love, country roads, yeah. John Denver. Yeah, they love oh those my ones. God. And so uh, I wanted to do that because, hey, it's like easy money. And I, did, I was a singer-songwriter. I played guitar and sang, and I had a bunch of songs. And I would go to these gigs, and they'd be like, how come this one looks Chinese? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm half Chinese. My dad's from Hong Kong. And they'd be like, OK, we'll pay you half as much as a real foreigner. <laughs> Yeah, and so uh, I decided to um, pretend to be Mexican, mm -hmm. like yeah. you do, <laughs> because they don't really know what they don't Mexicans know. look like. They don't know enough. They don't Mexican. really have a lot of Mexicans in China, <laughs> and so I could get away with it. They're like, sure, okay, yeah. whatever. And so my, my, my stage name that they thought was my actual name was Enchilada Grande. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they, they called me Enchi for short. Enchi. Yeah, Enchi. <laughs> And I did, I, I'd play La Bamba and Celito Lindo and you know, and then we oh, also, classics. me and my, um, me and my, uh, my housemate Lance, he was also a musician, we had a little band called Renjamin B and the Pillow Biters. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so we would, you know, we'd, we, we'd came up with uh, these really not even like PG-13 obscene versions of Hotel California. And <laughs> people don't know what you're saying. And, and, and most of the time people didn't know what we were saying, except sometimes one guy did. Yeah, and then uh, you yeah, say, I, you see somebody in the back on. <laughs> yeah, it was very, very uh, puerile, <laughs> yeah. but uh, we had fun. That's had so fun. funny. Yeah, it's definitely, there's, um, uh, you know, it's funny, the, uh, there, there are not a lot of Mexicans in China. Um, and I remember that you, you say, like, the Chinese don't know the Mexicans. Even the Mexicans don't know the Mexicans. <laughs> because I remember one time I had a, I was at a, a fundraiser dinner, and I sat next to this woman, and she's like, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I do Chinese comedy. I'm like, what do you do? And she's like, oh, I'm the wife of the consul general of the Mexican embassy. I'm like, oh. Uh, and then I told her, because I had met um, a Mexican friend of mine studying, a, a Mexican guy who was studying at, um, at uh, the Beijing Language and Culture University with me. And I told her, like, oh, I'm, I, I met a Mexican uh, guy who was studying in China with me. And she's like, who was he? I'm like, well, <laughs> like, like you know, she was like surprised, like, you know, like, you know I don't, I just, do I know him? Like, <laughs> it was weird. But the, um, it was definitely one of those things where this like performer e uh, ecosystem is real. And it was actually, it's really good if you want to make some quick cash. It turns out though, it's really bad if you want to be a professional performer mm -hmm. because you have no leverage when they're like, hey, we're just, we just need any white guy. 
So like, I was like, I speak Chinese well. And they're like, yeah, but you want another 50 bucks. So mm. yeah, it was like, there was, no, there was no way to actually show you to well. And so actually it, it turned out to be part of the reason why I went into doing like more and more, um, like writing my own material was because I was like, oh, there's never gonna be a role for someone like me. They're just not gonna write it. Yeah. And so it's actually, it makes me very empathetic towards a lot of the people now. I live in LA, they're, they're trying to make movies in Hollywood. There's all sorts of people who look different, speak different, talk different. Um, and it's like, you know, one of these things like, yeah, it's not easy to convince all those people up at all the different ranks of stuff that like, you should do things your way. And that's part of the reason why I always encourage people to make their own stuff because, you know, we're gonna be waiting a long time for Netflix to, uh, you know, green light this. Um, <laughs> but hopefully not. Uh, hopefully not. Hopefully not. But um, so continuing in China, what would you say uh, on a day to day life is like kind of the biggest misconceptions Americans have about living in China? Oh, I mean, one is that it's this like, like you're saying earlier, that's just like this like hyper bureaucracy, police state, like mm. censorship all over the place. And, you know, I, I'm honestly, I felt a lot freer living in China than I do in America, mostly because of the the shackles of economic oppression, just gonna say that. Um, it's cheaper, makes, I mean, you can, you can live very differently when it's cheaper. Absolutely. Like, there's a lot of choices, like when I first moved there, like to do comedy full time, I think a lot of people are like, whoa, that's really brave. But like, part of it was, it wasn't necessarily even that. I was like, even what you, like, you could, there were always gonna be some ways of making enough money you could pay rent. Yeah. And, and the food was really cheap. And it was good. And really good. And, and so it was like, well, if I can pay my rent and I can eat out as much as I want and the food is good, like that was enough when I was 22, where I was like, this is worth giving it a shot. Absolutely. Whereas like, I don't think that if I had graduated from college and had been like, I want to try to be a comedian or performer in America of any sort, like, you know, the, you know I live in LA, like the rent is nuts. The rent is nuts everywhere. Yeah. And so like you make very different choices if that's the case. So, Absolutely. so like what, what were some of the things that you felt were just like great deals in China? Oh, I mean, well, I mean like, you know, we could take a nap at work. That mm. was cool. That was yeah. like allowed. <laughs> we had like siesta time every day after yeah. lunch. This was before work from home where you could like put up a cardboard cut out of yourself <laughs> in front of the Zoom camera. Right, <laughs> yeah. And like my boss had a cot in her office. Like mm. that was, it was not like you're sneaking away to take a nap. It's like, okay, nap time, everybody. It's like kindergarten again. And so <laughs> just the, the, the relaxed attitude towards work and people just weren't just hustling all the time. People mm. were enjoying their lives. Mm. And, um, and I think also like to the first time I really, you know, I used to have dreadlocks down to my butt and I did before I moved that. to China. Yeah, long, long dreads. Can we cut to a picture of that? Yeah. <laughs> what is it? What is it? And, uh, and then I, I cut them off before I moved to China because like I'm going to be a researcher. I need to be taken seriously. I don't want to yeah. stand out as a foreigner. I want to like be respectable. No one would have You don't want to be the limnologist with dreads. Right. I did. I did. <laughs> Although in retrospect, it would have been fine. Yeah. Nate remembers my dreads. He remembers mm. those. He was there when we got them cut off. And, <laughs> and, uh, and so I remember, um, you know, coming there with this, like, really, even as a Chinese American, coming there, I was like, okay, I'm gonna, like, watch my wallet and, like, mm. watch my stuff all the time. And, like, if I see a cop, just, like, act cool, like, be mm, natural. Yeah. I remember being at a, a red light on my illegal motorcycle. And, you know, normally I would just go through the red lights if there's no one coming mm -hmm. because it's there, there are traffic customs. It's a suggestion. It's a suggestion, traffic suggestions. Yeah. Um, at least in Chengdu in 2010. Yeah. And uh, I remember coming up to a red light and I was like, oh, there's a cop here, I better stop. And I stop and then the cop like look both ways, runs the red light. I'm like, all right, here we go. Yeah. We're just going to run this red Behind light him. together. What's he gonna do? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> as long as I don't pass him, I'm good. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then I'd say just the, the, the sense of community. Uh, I remember living in, in a little Xiaochu in Chengdu, the little you know, apartment complex courtyard area where I lived if I, my clothes would get holes in them and there's a lady with a sewing machine in the courtyard every single yeah. day and you take down a whole pile of clothes to her and then you pick them up three days later and they're all fixed and it costs like a dollar eighty. Yeah, or it's like, like crazy. That. that was one of the best things about having the motorbike and just living in China in general was like they hadn't uh, evolved economically to the point where they threw away stuff just because it was cheaper to buy new stuff. So like whether that's evolution or not, but it was, it was nice because it kind of felt like it was also a community sense of yeah. thing. Like, you know, I had my guy who repaired my e-bike. I had the place where I could get like dry cleaning done. I had the fruit stand lady, yes. you know, like you could have all these people that were like very close by and it was all kind of walking distance, which was really nice. And they so. know you, yeah. you know, and you're, they're like, oh, your grapes are free today yeah. because whatever, I just feel like giving you Yeah, it's grapes. free grape day. <laughs> you yeah. didn't know that? <laughs> yeah. 
traditional holiday. <laughs> yeah, I remember getting stuck in a, a restaurant, Mike, my, my first day moving into my new apartment and just being on my own. I didn't speak very good Chinese at the time. No one I knew spoke English because my, my roommate who did speak English, was mm. an American, was in another province mm -hmm. on a, like a work trip. And so I was just all by myself in Chengdu, first week in Chengdu, going to this little restaurant by the hospital. And I'm in there and it starts raining and the boss just gives me an umbrella. Mm. And I'm like, oh, okay, thank you so much. Like, I'll come bring it back, you know, tomorrow. And they're like, whatever. It's like, yeah, yeah. you know, fine, just keep it. And I was like, wow, that's really nice and easy. And mm. now I'm, I'm just not having to walk home in the rain. And, and also like, I love the way that people will not let you pay for your own food. Oh yeah, if you go out with like friends or like, especially if you're like in a meeting, you know, any sort of thing like that, they will just like, they'll refuse. Like it's, they, they'll fight you hard. They will fight you physically. Fight you they will hard. pull you away and maybe put you on the ground if they have to, to yeah. prevent you from paying for your own food. <laughs> and the idea of like going Dutch and everyone paying for their own stuff and sitting there and calculating yeah. the tab is so tacky to the yeah. Chinese. It is the height of like gauche. Mm. And I, I really appreciate that, that there's less of this like calculating. Everyone's kind of trying to get yeah, there. It, it feels like there is, because what it does is it kind of ties people together. It's like, well, if you meet a new friend or whatever, it's like, well, I'll hang out with you again. We won't like, you know, if you split the bill, you could kind of never see each other again. And so it's it weird because I felt like as an American in the beginning, it made me uncomfortable to be indebted to people. Yep. But then later I was like, oh, that's kind of what makes everything work. It's like, they're not big debts. Like, it's not like you're gonna be like in real trouble right. if you don't treat the other guy out. But even that little stuff, it's like, it, it kind of is like when you have a good friend and you look at each other and you don't need to talk, you kind of know what's going on. It kind of felt like the whole society ran that way a little bit in a way that like, you know, in, in the States, it's like you have that within communities. Mm -hmm. But if you go out into the world, like, you know, you're not going to go to like, a, you're not going to go to Burger King and the boss is like, yeah, Hugh, we got you. Like, you know, like, what? <laughs> like that's not going to happen. So um, uh, so one or two more questions about, uh, about uh, life in China and then we'll take a little quick break. Um, but I'd say now that you're back in the States, what's one thing that you appreciate about being back in the States that you missed when you were in China mm. or that now that you're back, you're like, it's, that's pretty nice. That's a good one. Mexican food? Mexican food. Yeah. I dig I, it. I did not miss American food when I was in China, but I did miss Mexican did food. Did people say this to you too? I, ha I had at least 12 people say this to me every time I came back to the States and I said I lived in China. They'd be like, you should start a Mexican restaurant. Just Americans had this idea that for some reason that there weren't going to be Mexican restaurants in China. If they were, they would be bad. And if you made a good one, you'd make a ton of money. Did, no did one's you, ever suggested no that. No one said that to me. But it's a great idea. It is a great it's idea. It's true. They don't have Mexican <laughs> restaurants in China. Not a good one. They had one place called someone's Tex Mex, Phil's Tex Mex or something in Chengdu. It was not good. Mm. Um, sorry if you're watching mm. this. You know, it's like yeah. I'm from Texas, so it's, yeah. I've got a high standard for, for, for Mexican yeah. food and Tex Mex yeah. in general. And uh, uh, no, no, it's a great idea. It was one, there's this one, one guy in Beijing, he runs a place called Pebbles, a Chinese guy who lived in Mexico for like two years and like found all these great tequila manufacturers and like imports the tequila artisanally like we do for tea. And it's like, I, I sat up on the roof of Pebbles talking to this guy and I was like, like, th like you need to make videos, man. Like, you know, this is what I've learned about the world. It's like, if you're trying to do something like that, that's niche, like the internet is your friend. Yeah. And like, you know, it's, it's hard, as you know, to do that while also running a shop and a business and to make all that content. But it is, I, I have hope for it because I felt like Chinese people were in many ways more open to the foreign cuisines, like, because it all has to be expensive in the beginning. Yeah. And like in the beginning, even the Mexican restaurant, you go to get a taco, like the taco is like $7 in America and in China, that's like $12 or whatever yeah. for their income. And like, it's going to be expensive at the start, but the restaurants were full. Yeah. Like people were willing to give it a try. So. Uh, that's very encouraging. So, other than Mexican food, is there anything else about the states that you're that you that you missed when you were in China? And now that you're back, you're happy to have it. Uh, yeah, the the cheapest thing that you can get won't definitely kill you right away here. <laughs> yeah. So that's that. I remember like out get, moving into my first apartment on my own, and like you know, not someone else's apartment. It's like me getting like stuff for my apartment and furnishing it. And I went down to the, the, the hardware store under my apartment and I was buying a power strip. Mm. And the guy, and I was, I was like, well, this one's the cheapest one. Let me get this one. Thinking like, I don't yeah, need cut a fancy to. power strip. <laughs> literally, literally. And the guy was like, get this one. That's a little more expensive because this is the Ming Pai. This is yeah, a yeah. famous brand. I was like, I don't need a famous yeah. brand. <laughs> I'm not trying to show strip. off my power strip. And I brought it home, <laughs> I plugged it, and it immediately explodes. Boom. <laughs> 
Ah. And I brought it back. I was like, it broke. He's like, yeah, that's why you don't get the cheap one. I was like, that's why funny. do you sell it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, why yeah. do you sell yeah, it? You shouldn't be able to sell it. And he's like, sometimes they don't explode. Like, yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's kind of a crash. Which, which was on the box, if you read it. That yeah, was there. Yeah, like, sometimes yeah, yeah. My they Chinese don't wasn't that good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, my version of that was like, I remember Chinese New Year. Um, it used to be that you could set off fireworks within the Fifth Ring Road in Beijing. So they had these fireworks stand that would pop up like seasonally. And I went over and the, like, it was just this little firecracker and it had this like tiny, tiny, tiny fuse. And I asked a guy, I'm like, how do you set that off? And he's like, yeah, hey, you like the fuse. I'm like, the fuse is that long. Like, it's going to blow up immediately. He's like, yeah, like, you know, it's, it's one kwai. What do you want? <laughs> one kwai is like 15 cents. I'm like, charge me 30 cents and like, give me more fuse. <laughs> like, like, but it was, it was sort of nuts like that. It's like the, the cheapest thing. I mean, that was intentionally supposed to explode. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like, but like, there were some things where I was like, you know, even in this country where the incomes are lower, people could pay two kwai for that firework instead of one. Like, maybe make it a little bit easier. So that's a good, that's a good point. I feel like the general, the general like uh, floor here is maybe a little bit higher for some of that stuff. Yeah, so. at least compared to 2010 era Chengdu. Oh yeah, good, good yeah. stuff. Anyway, we're gonna take a little bit of a quick break. We're gonna be back with another tea, and uh, thank you all so much for coming to the live recording. <laughs> Of Tea Time with Jesse. We'll be right back. Hey there. I'm from one of those online mattress companies. Apparently, people who listen to podcasts have an insatiable desire for mattresses, like can't get enough fairy tale shit or something like that. The problem with most mattresses, though, is they make lousy tea. Just ask this guy who's not a paid shill. Well, I, I tried drinking my mattress, and it was pretty bad. I mean, first, I just put my lips on it and started sucking, but that didn't really work. Uh, then I poured hot water on it, but uh, that just made it wet and hot. Also, my girlfriend was like, it's 4 a.m., what are you doing? <laughs> She's always like that. <laughs> the problem would be solved if instead of a mattress, you were drinking Jesse's Tea House teas. Jesse gets teas straight from small tea shops and tea farmers in China and puts them into his subscription service. Just use the code JESSEPOD for $10 off your first order of $30 and stop trying to drink your mattress. And we're back at West China Tea House with a live studio audience. Oh! This is great. Is this your first time drinking tea in front of an audience? I mean, like not making them tea, but just like drinking tea. I think so, <laughs> maybe. I've definitely made tea for people in front of an audience before. This is mm. maybe my first time just addressing an audience and just that's, drinking tea. That's good. What do you think? Right. What do you think? Is it, got, is it nice? Yeah, it's Could you weird. get used to this? Yeah, um, yeah I could get used to it. It's, uh, it's a little weird, but it's fine. It's fun. It's, yeah. it's great. Thank you again so much for coming, everybody. It's really fun to be able to share the tea with people in person as well as online. Um, we're going to be drinking a second tea. Uh, this next one is actually one I'm super excited to get your take on because this is my tea guy, Dui Dui's 2010 Reserve. Uh, ancient tree cooked puar tea. So this is a very, very nice tea, which, um, so Dui Dui is a friend of mine that um, I met through tea friends. He was one of the first people to notice in the domestic Chinese market that the uh, ancient tree tea was just better. Yeah. So like 30 oh, years wow. ago, people knew that like, oh, those trees are older, but they didn't know that the leaves were that much better. Mm -hmm. And now in the last 30 years, there's not only scientific evidence, but everybody who drinks tea, if you drink a lot of poor tea, you know that you get better depth of flavor and all sorts of stuff out of that. So he set up his relationships with these farmers like 30 years ago. And a lot of these tea farmers, they, they have, you know, they're, they're super lucky, uh, it feels to me, because they had the, the trees on their land. Yep. And every year they just hire some people to go pick them. And then some of them like really care and they do the processing themselves. Other they're like, I'm happy to sell all my tea to one guy and then have him sell it uh, away. And then once they have that guy, they just don't switch. Yeah. So uh, Dwayne Dwayne got in with a lot of those people. He had his tea people and he bought up a lot of ancient tree tea for really good prices, uh, including this stuff from 2010, uh, which you can take a look here at the, uh, the tea cake. So it's just really, really nice. Um, ancient tree puar. Got the tea cake for you guys to take a look at. Um, and this is uh, this is from Xishuan Bana. Huh? Well, it's okay. fine. <laughs> we'll just keep going. The um, and uh, this stuff is like really, really nice. And I get um, I'm interested to hear your take on it. I get like a little bit of like a jujube, like you know, mm. sort of flavor to it. 
Uh, well, and the, the other thing about this is it's super dark. Like I remember the, the wash steep for this looks like the second or third steep from a lot of other cook pouvoirs. So this is about as fast as I could make that wash steep. And we're already kind yeah. of there. Um, and you'll see how dark it gets. It gets dark like coffee. Mm, smell that. Mm -hmm. That's, that's mm -hmm. good stuff. So this is, um, this is definitely one of those teas for people who are a little bit interested in darker, earthier. We can wash this first one, give it to Chonky Horse. Darker, earthier, um, for people that haven't had a lot of cooked pu'ar, um, this is gonna taste different from what you think tea tastes like. Right. You know, so like a lot of people are like, oh, tea, you know, they might even be thinking of green tea. This is about as far to the other side as you could go. Super dark, super earthy, um, very rich. Um, I almost like think of, uh, I went to Spain once and I had like uh, Mexican, uh, like Spanish drinking chocolate, oh, you know, yeah. like that sort of like thicker stuff. If you were to steep this long, that's kind of what it tastes like. It's like really, really got some pop to it. So excited to hear what you think about it. Um, what is your, do you, are you a cooked pu'ar guy? Are you a raw pu'ar guy? Are you a, I assume you drink pu'ar. <laughs> I sure do. We've yeah. talked about this. Yeah, I, shung, uncooked, well, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. funny, nomenclature-wise. They're, they're all cooked, but the yeah. un unfermented one, mm. shung pu'ar, is actually my favorite kind of tea overall. Yeah, Beautiful. So look at that color. So it's a little bit tricky to tell, although you can tell from our perspective, if you put it right through the light, as dark as it is, it's still transparent. Yeah. Yep, yep. It's still you really can hold clear. It up to this lamp back there see if, if you maybe I don't know if it'll forward. show through for your guys. It'll depend on where your eyes are, but if you can get it there, it's like really, really dark, but still quite clear. Yeah, you don't want it to be cloudy. Yeah, cloudy. That's that's one of the ways. A lot of times, I feel so bad. Like sometimes people will be like really curious, and they'll be like, I I found like I heard about Puar online, and then I bought some on Amazon or wherever, <laughs> and then it's like it tastes like fish, or it's like it's not that good. I'm like, it's almost assuredly like bad pu'ar, right. but this is not bad pu'ar. Cheers. Cheers. There we go. See what you think of that. Oh yeah. Mm. This is, um, Doido is just like a super solid guy because like this easily could have been sold to me for four times the price that I put it on my shop. And it's like, he, he gave us a good deal on it so we could put it in the subscription, so. Mm. Mm. Yeah, like malty. Yeah. Leathery. Got some nice, like, leathery, like, saddly kind of notes. Mm. Saddly. I like mm -hmm. it. I got to come up with better adjectives. <laughs> I learned a lot of my tea adjectives in Chinese, and then I came back to the States, and I'm like, what does it taste like? I'm like, how do you say, like, nong yu? Like, you know. Right. right. <laughs> like, you know, sort of, like, rich, very kind of rich flavor. The white tea that we had in the first half is a better tea if you're just going to, like, I want to drink some big cups of tea. This is like, I want to sit, I want to sip it a little bit slowly because if you chug this, it'd be a little bit much. So let's talk about tea because you're also a tea guy. Um, and you said that you'd started uh, drinking Chinese tea in your family. You kind of came through the Hong Kong tradition. Mm -hmm. What do Hong Kongers drink at home? Like this. This yeah, is what like they this. drink? Uh, yeah, fermented pu'ar. Uh, yeah. That's what they love. They call it bo lei ta. And mm. they, you know, uh, my dad's from Hong Kong and they, it's very humid there. And mm. so the pu'ar that lives in Hong Kong, that yeah. gets aged in Hong Kong, is what we call wet stored pu'ar, mm -hmm. as opposed to dry stored pu'ar. If you've mm -hmm. got the pu'ar aging in Yunnan, in kind of a higher, drier climate, then it ends up being dry stored and it changes more slowly, mm. but I, I feel like it retains a lot of the, uh, the nuance, mm -hmm. whereas the wet stored pu'ar gets dark and funky earthy it, really yeah, fast. Yeah, it, it, it oxidizes fast. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, um, yeah, so, so you would drink stuff like this growing up and, uh, and then you went to China and like, when did you realize like, oh, there's many different, many, many different types of tea? Uh, it was in college, you know, so in the timeline, I was born, Okay, that's good. Where's a good place to start? Yeah, he's Drink like, let me tea. tell you the timeline of how this happened. I was born. I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> when are we getting to the end of this story? <laughs> born, dim sum, college. Okay. And in college, I was introduced to the practice of Gongfu Cha and the kind of culture of trying a diversity of teas around that. Because in you know when I was growing up, there was. Puar, there was Puar with chrysanthemum gopo, there yep. was uh, Ti Kun Yam, which is Tie Guan Yin, yep. uh, Iron Goddess of Mercy, Oolong, uh, Heng Bin, which is how they say Mo Li Hua Cha. Okay. Uh, very, very different. And uh, very occasionally we'd get Sao Mi, which is Shou Mei, you know, mm. the aged white tea. And that was pretty much it. Those mm. are the kinds of teas that we had access yeah. to. And it was, it was in, I was in high school when I first 
thought I wanted to get into tea because mm -hmm. there was this great scene in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon where, mm -hmm. where uh, uh, Michelle Yeoh drops a gaiwan in midair and Zhang Ziyi like catches it in midair and it reassembles itself, this thing, a gaiwan, which is almost impossible to do. And that's like how you know Zhang Ziyi is the secret ninja. And I was like, Dad, what are these things that they're drinking tea with? And he's like, oh, it's like a little teapot you drink out of it. Because that's traditionally what you do with a gaiwan is you drink right out of it. Mm. And so I went to you know, the Chinese grocery and in, in Houston, where we have lots of Chinese people, and I bought a gaiwan and I bought some really crappy jasmine tea and mm. tried to go home and make it. And the, the gaiwan was so bad and the tea was so bad that I just gave up because mm. it was so hot to use. It's really, it's really kind of unfortunate. Like a lot of times, people ask online, they're like, "Oh, can I go? Like, can I get this at a grocery store or anything like that?" And the way I kind of look at it is like the different tiers of teas. You have Western grocery store tea. Chinese or Asian grocery store tea, which will be better, but it's still fundamentally a mass production product that was put together by a company for mass distribution. I actually thought originally I might be able to source, um, or not source, but like get the Chinese tea into Asian grocery stores, and I found out they're like, no, 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 we, we have a contract with somebody, they send us all the tea in the box beforehand. It's like, it is, even though it is better, it is still a mass market product, and then it's like, the worst stuff you can find at the tea market will actually be better than the best stuff you can find at the Asian grocery right. in the States. Or even in China, like if you go yeah. to a, a grocery store in China, it's still grocery store tea, yeah. you know? And it'll be better than what you can get in the Asian groceries in the States, but it's still, it's not the same like path of the tea. Yeah. And so that's part of the, the like one of, you know, discovery is the wrong word, but I had a kind of that revelation where I was like, oh, it's like, I'm sure people like, you know, anybody who really likes, you know, whatever shoes or something like that, there's like a market for that. Mm -hmm. And then it occurred to me, it's like, oh, of course there's going to be a market for tea that is different than just a consumable product, right. like, you know, th with the bag. So you got into tea, so you, you failed to get into tea. Tried, failed, yeah. went yeah. to college. Born again. Right. And, so tried and to then get I, <laughs> I uh, one day I was on the other side of town to, to uh, go to a glass shop to get something made of glass. And, okay. uh, As you do, real <laughs> casual, college. And, um, real casual. And I, I saw custom across made. the street was a little shop called Chai Kana Tea Culture. And, and uh, this is in Santa Cruz, California, go slugs. And mm. I went into this, I was like, that looks cool. I went to the shop and there was a man named David Wright, mm. who, uh, 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 you know, Jewish dude. Mm a little older than us, yep. pouring tea, wearing Chinese robes in the back of this, like, you ever see Gremlins? <laughs> you, you, know the, you know the little shop where yeah. he steals gizmo from? There's Don't all this put crazy water stuff. on the, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So it was like that. It was like all this very, like, esoteric stuff on the walls, like teapots and gong da bays yeah. and little tea pets and everything. And I was like, what is this place? And there was just, no one was in there. I went to the back, David Wright, sitting at the back, pouring tea from a little stone teapot. He served me a little cup of, of, uh, of, of silver needle. Mm. And I was like, this is so cool, what is this? And he was like, yeah, this is Gong Fu Cha. This is like a, it's kind of, it's not really a ceremony. It's more like a, a practice that we do. And he actually still has a tea shop in Santa Cruz. If you find yourself in Santa Cruz, go to Hidden Peak Tea House. Hidden Peak Tea House, uh, the, they, he got me into it. And also, uh, Ch uh, Shen's gallery, um, April Shun, was kind of the matriarch of the the Santa Cruz tea scene. She's from Taiwan, and she's the one I actually studied the most with because her shop was close to my house. So I got into it. I bought a tea set. I was 20 years old, so I've been doing this more than half my life now. I turned 40 this year. And so I was 20 years old. I wasn't old enough to buy alcohol, um, but I bought a tea set. I could buy tea, and I bought some tea uh, with my college budget, and I would, came home, and I made, would make tea for my housemate, my girlfriend, and everything. And then that just became what we did for fun. That mm. just became our social thing that we did by the time I was 21, there was no room in my life for social drinking. I was mm. already do drinking tea socially. And mm. So I started right off my adulthood drinking tea, doing Gong Fu Cha and making that the center of my, my social life. And it, really, I really got into it. it really has that like effect. It's like, it's a, it's, it's sort of weird. It's a very subtle, but a big statement. If you go into a space and there's like a tea table on the living room table, and it's like, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna sit, we're gonna drink tea. And it's like, you don't have to obviously, but it's like, it creates that environment where like, we're going to socialize. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing that I really liked about it was that like, you know, it, especially I think like as, as guys, it's weird to like invite another guy over to your place and just sit and talk. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's, it shouldn't be, but for some reason, like you have to do something, right? So I think like a lot of times it's like in America, you watch the game. 
and there's, I like watching sports. There's nothing wrong at all with watching sports. I love doing it. But like, why do we have to be staring into a screen like that in order to spend time together? And so that was the thing that when I kind of moved to China and when I had my tea table, I realized it's like, oh, all these people I kind of just want to hang out with, I should just invite them over for tea. Yep. Like if they're around the weekend, come over for tea. Um, I had a bunch of people that like, even like networking as a, as a performer, I was like, I basically made a rule. It's like, if anybody wanted to have a conversation with me about any project, whether I thought it was worthwhile or not, I'm like, if you'll come to my place at 10 a.m. any given day, you know, as a comedian, I have the days off. If you'll come over and have tea, I'll talk to anybody, yep. you know? And, um, and it was, it made me feel very open socially. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been one of the best things about being back in the States is being able to have that sort of like open socialization, uh, like easy socialization come into my life. Mm -hmm. So for, so, okay, so you got into the Gong Fu Tea, uh, you, uh, and then when you moved to China, I'm assuming it just like supercharged. Yeah, you know. absolutely. So I got into Gong Fu Cha and then I was doing that for years and years and years. And I started teaching like little classes through the free school in the front yard of a church, mostly to homeless people. Um, and so I had like this like homeless posse in Santa Cruz. I was the only student who knew all the homeless people. I had so much clout with them. They would come up and like, they're, like, they're your tea, yeah, they're they're like my tea drinkers. Yeah, we drank tea together. That's great. Um, and then I, you know, moved back to Texas, moved to Austin, got a job at Jade Leaves Tea House. Uh, I've got some homies from back in the day there and uh, uh, now defunct, but was a great little tea spot on Guadalupe back in the day. And I served tea there. I helped develop their tea program. And then I moved to China in 2010. And it was like, I'd never seen a living tea plant before and I'd never had mm -hmm. farm direct tea. I'd mm -hmm. had good, like you're talking, there's all these grades of tea. You've got like the yeah. worst of the worst, you know, just like commodity tea sold to Western market, then commodity tea to the Chinese market. And then like, you know, more artisan, but still more or less factory tea, like mm -hmm. beings of Pu'ar with the yeah. serial number, you know, yeah. at the tea house. And then, and then my first day in my office in Chengdu where I worked, yeah. you know, we were an environmental organization. So we would help these farmers go organic, you know, and, and stop using pesticides, start um, composting and everything like that. And so one of the farms that they'd worked with was a tea farm. And they mm -hmm. had this green tea, su mao fang, just yeah. very basic, the most basic tea that you would drink in, in Sichuan province, mm -hmm. just there in a jar on the table. And I, I just made myself like a paper cup of this tea with hot water. Mm. And it was the best green tea I'd ever had. Yeah. After seven years of yeah. getting the best tea that I could afford and trying to you know, mm. make it and drink it. And I love green tea. I was mm. like, this is the best green tea I've ever had. And I was like, what is this tea called? And they're like, it doesn't really have a name. Just Malfung, you know, it's yeah. a kind of generic name for green tea. If you yeah. don't want to call it something else, they call it Malfung. And, and then I started, and then people knew that I was into tea. So my coworkers would introduce me to tea farmers, tea masters, people that they yeah. knew. And um, that was, yeah. And it was, so I just, when I had time off, you mm -hmm. know, I was working, doing research. And then I had time off for, you know, a couple of days off. I would go up to the tea mountains, go to Omeishan with my freaking guitar and yeah. everything, my, my tent and uh, go to, uh, you, you took a trip to Yunnan, Yunnan, just like got off of a, you know, taxi uh, in a tea mountain. And it was like, well, I'm here. I guess I'll yeah. go and talk to people about tea. It's also, it's, it's funny, like it's, it's tricky to find the best stuff at the price you want with the right tea people and the vibes and the trust is there. But when you go to these places, it's not hard to find tea. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's, there's, lots of, uh, there's lots of tea around and so, what was the way that you decided that like, oh, this is somebody that I actually want to work with and bring their tea to the States? And where do you go like, I don't actually really want to work with you. Right. What was your internal compass? Well, it's interesting because I didn't come, I didn't meet people with the intention of starting a tea company. I was just a, an enthusiast yeah. going off and enjoying my time off by engaging in my hobby and getting in touch with the people who make the thing that I enjoy. And mm -hmm. so like Li Xu Lin, who makes our puars and mm -hmm. Ding Ding Xiang, who makes our uh, green teas, uh, or Sichuanese green teas, the, the jasmine that we, I made earlier, and some of these initial tea people that I met, I just met them as an enthusiast. I was like, really, I went to Nanwa Mountain because I wanted to see what these ancient trees looked like. I wanted mm -hmm. to see a big, tall, ancient tea, tea tree and like touch it and mm -hmm. chew on a leaf, you know, et cetera. And so I just showed up, you know, Nanwa Mountain showed up on, on a, like a break and I just, there's no bus stop there. You have to tell the driver that you get on the bus from uh, Jinghong to Menghai and you mm. tell them, I want to get off on Nanwa Mountain. Yep. 
And then if you want to get down off the mountain, you got to hitchhike down because yeah. there's no bus stop. I, I have a funny Jing Hong to Menghai uh, bus story. Ooh, did nice. I tell you? Did I no, tell this story? No. This, so, so I took that bus, uh -huh. and it's an overnight bus. So you, like uh, it was basically um, uh, you, you, like it was like an eight-hour bus ride. Um, or was this from Kunming, Kunming to Jing? Yeah, this was from Kunming yeah. to Jing Hong. But I, so basically I was on an eight hour bus ride in Yunnan going towards the T mountains. And uh, the, the guy, the bus driver looked at me and my friend, there were two Americans there, two white guys. And he looked at the guys and, and he, he was like, I was like, what was that? He like sized this up for a bit. And so I asked the driver, I was like, oh, is, is there a problem? He's like, no, 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 it's just, you looked a little bit like this, this British guy that was on the bus last time. And that was a problem because he was a drug smuggler. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, he, uh, he put a bunch of like drugs in a condom up his butt. And then we got stopped at a checkpoint and they went and searched everybody and they took him behind the bus and they found it and he got in big trouble and he almost got me in trouble. So I was just checking if like you knew him. I'm like, oh, I don't know that guy. <laughs> and then so I was like, oh, that's weird. I told my friend about it and we're like, ha 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 ha. Anyway, we take this bus ride. It's like three in the morning. It's like a sleeper bus. Three in the morning. <laughs> on and it turns out that they got stopped by the enforcement people yep. again and uh they and they make every they they had a guy come on the bus and he's looking around like who might be suspicious and it's me like lying there like mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then i was like this goddamn british guy <laughs> like <laughs> if this man like you know means that i'm responsible now and i have to get out of this bus and pull my pants down like you know like oh that guy if i ever find him um, and so luckily he like kind of looked at us and he looked at the, he looked at the driver and the driver went like, and then the guy was like, <laughs> 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 and then he left. I'm like, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, I'm glad I talked yeah, to that driver. Cause yeah. like if the driver had been like, I don't know him, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, then we might've had problems. So, um, yeah, if you go to Yunnan, don't smuggle anything. Don't do not put yeah. condoms full of drugs up your butt. Don't put condoms full of anything up your butt. Yeah, I think well, just, I mean, it, you do what you want. You yeah, know, again, yeah, I, adults, oh, that's but, true. But not on the bus, that's not true. on the bus to jail. Not on the bus. Yeah. I was um, thinking objects, but I guess, you know, whatever you it know, is. So. You know, your, your body, your choice. But, yeah. um, but I feel like I should have like a, you should have a series be like extremely narrow advice for <laughs> extremely narrow situations. Uh, and then I'm like, this is where we hit them with that advice. But yeah. <laughs> Those buses are, it, it's funny, like the buses that, it, I'm glad I was asleep for that first <laughs> bus ride, you know, because the, oh, the mountain roads there are so windy that the second time I went on them when it was daytime, I was like every single blind curve, I'm like, and this is how I die. Yeah. And then, and then, and then like you go around it and like, thank God there wasn't a car. And then there's another one 20 seconds later and it's like, and this is how I die. And like, <laughs> and it'd be like that for hours. Yeah. And so I'm glad I slept through the first one. Like, you know, my friends in Yunnan were like, you're taking the bus or you should really fly. I'm like, no, nah, it's fine. Like, you know, what's going to happen? They're like, you could go off a cliff. There could be another bus. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go to sleep. Either I wake up or I don't. <laughs> like, like, uh, it's like, what's going to happen? Like, if I don't wait, if I wouldn't know, right? <laughs> I, I have so many stories about the bus ride from Kunming to Jinghong, because mm. it used to be the only way to get to Xishuangbana, which is our sister city. Jinghong is our sister city. Our really? Sister, yeah. I'm actually the chair of the board hey, of the sister city relationship you should between be. Austin and Sichuan Bana. Yeah. Jinghong's great. And actually, and, uh, yeah, I know it's amazing. I love Jinghong. It's a great the first place. time I went there, it was so different. I remember sure. walking through like the, the, the Dai neighborhoods with like there was no pavement. There's like pool tables outside. I'm playing pool with these people. They don't speak Chinese. They're, they're speaking like Dai. They speak pool. Yeah, exactly. We're speak playing us. pool together. Like, you know, <laughs> it starts raining and they're like, oh, just keep playing. We're playing pool in the rain. Uh, yeah, I love, love Jinghong, amazing city. It's our sister city, and we are gonna, on in December, I think it's 9th, December 9th, we're doing the Passport to the World event, and we're gonna be there tabling for representing Shishuang Bana. That's great. There. Um, yeah, so many stories about that bus ride. A lot of them involve poop or pee. Mm. Uh, but uh, you t another time. I don't, we don't have, to have time for all my stories about that. Oh, I thought you said we don't have time to poop and pee at the same time. Like, I was like, what? <laughs> like, like, yeah. um, so yeah, so let, let's, let's leave that aside right, though. Right, right, Get back right. to the tea. Back so, to, uh, yeah. So you've now uh, you know, been back in the States. You've opened this tea house as a way to help educate people about tea. What do you think is like the biggest misconception that Americans have about tea? 
Uh, tea is what you call any plant steeped in hot water. That is the number one misconception that yes. Americans have about tea. And that is like, and it's a sensitive thing to bring up because people feel like People love their stupid. tea. Yeah, they love, they love their sleepy time or like lemon zinger or whatever. And then you have to be like, oh, it's not really tea. And I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's not technically tea because tea is the name of a plant. And so it's a very yeah. sensitive conversation to have. And I have it all the time, every day. Yeah. Because the majority of people who come in here, you know, or maybe at least at least half, are not familiar with Chinese tea culture, yeah. they, and they don't know that tea is the name of a plant. It was, it was, it, I felt it was good experience to have lived in China where like you'd have to break down American culture to that level of granularity where like they might just think like, oh, like, you know, ev like, oh, well, you know, I'm sure there's Eastern American food and Western American food. And I'm like, <laughs> it doesn't really work that way. Um, like you'd have to go through and explain that there are different regions and the different regions were settled by different people and the different people who and the people who settled it might actually not be the people who live there or the people in power might not be the people who are making the food and like it's very complicated and of course you know you can't expect them to know that yeah and so coming back here when I'm dealing with the people who are you know interested in China, I get a lot of comments on the internet they're like I have this sleepy time tea um, from this one tea house 14 years ago, and I've always missed it. Can you find it for me? I'm like, <laughs> I have no idea what's in that. And um, even in the, even if you look at like, uh, you know, I went to um, CVS and they had like a tea there, and it was like, you know, stomach aid tea. And I'm like, they sell real medicine here. Like, what's in that box? And I looked at the box, and it's like, there's like 18 different like herbs in there. And I'm like, I don't know medically whether that works, but either way, it's like, that's not kind of my fight. Right. You know? And so uh, how, do you, how do you deal with having to re-educate Americans about tea or anything with Chinese culture and don't just go crazy? Uh, you know, I, I really love introducing people to tea. It's still, it's still fun for me and I'm not sick of it yet. So. Um, you know, just, I just try to be really down to earth and, and uh, you know, gentle with that revelation so that people don't feel like they're being judged or talked down to. There is a strong tendency, you know, as we talked about this earlier mm. when we were having tea, that like in China, China, Chinese tea culture is very down to earth. Yeah. It's very chill. If we were doing this in China, there would be people for sure smoking cigarettes inside while we were doing this. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, and it's, very, it's very friendly and casual. And there's this tendency in America for people to elevate it and make it a ceremony or make it this formal thing. Mm. And, and you can get a lot of elitism in some of the more well-established tea communities. Like when I was living in California, that was something I came across mm -hmm. was that I came back from China, I went to visit Santa Cruz, and I went back to like my, you know, my home tea community and people were acting like I had leprosy or something. Like they, they did not want to have tea with me because mm. they were worried that I was coming to flex on them with my tea knowledge. Mm. And I was like, I'm just here to share tea that I came back with. But yeah. there was almost this like, like, oh, like I don't want to be wrong. Mm. I don't want this person who has been there to show me up and like flex on me. Yeah. And so I, when I came to Texas, I was like, I very, you know, very little tea culture here starting off, kind of a blank slate. And I was like, Texas tea culture is not going to be stuck up. Mm. And that was my, my determination, like right at the beginning, because that's mm -hmm. not how it is in China. Yeah. Know? And so I was determined to like be very down to earth and gentle and gracious with people in revealing that. And, and, uh, and people, if you can tell them in the right way, then they're really excited because like, oh my gosh, there's this whole world of stuff that I had no idea existed, just like whiskey or wine or coffee or cigars or whatever. Mm. There's this whole well-developed culture that is exciting, and now I'm excited to get into it rather than like, that guy was an asshole. He yeah, made yeah. me feel stupid. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it, it's definitely, it is like that. In, and it's one of the elements I try to bring about, like we were talking about this earlier, how I'll, I'll take like, you know, I, I have a, a, my tea pet is called Chonky Horse. And, um, and when I first put my first picture of Chonky Horse up on the internet, I just put underneath it, I said, oh Lord, he coming. And um, <laughs> he's a unit. And it was like, it was one of those moments where I realized it's like, this is maybe what, uh, like, maybe that's the American version of making people comfortable with tea. And I didn't do it on purpose, like this was a plan. It was like, it was like I want people to have fun having tea and just be like talking like they would normally. And, and even though there is a high 
there is a high-end Chinese tea ceremonial culture. Absolutely. It's almost like fashion. It's like you can get a $5 thing from the thrift shop and if you style it well, you can have your own fashion or you can have a $30,000 jacket or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, like they're both fashion, but you know, you get the choice to do it the way you want to do it. Right. And I think a lot of times when people are coming in, which is, a, they have this reflex, which is probably a good reflex to say, this is not my culture. I don't know how it's done. I'm going to over respect it rather than under respect it, mm -hmm. which is, I think a good, um, it's a good place to start. But then it also has to be matched with a, well, let me read the room here. Like, mm -hmm. you know, cause what, like, you know, maybe not come in and immediately just start telling people what to do with that other culture. But like, it is, it's a, we're losing a lot of, communication across cultures if we stay in that sort of worried like i'm going to over respect this forever because that like what being people that live across cultures is is you come down from that yeah you have to come down from that and if you don't come down from that you're kind of a forever tourist yeah you know and like the goal of like you know for me when i lived in china and what i hope chinese people and they come here to live in the states is like it's good to be a tourist there's nothing wrong with being a tourist but if you live in a place, if, if there's a way to come down, like you have to come down. You yeah. can't live here forever. Yeah. You have to be like, you know, chill about it. And so it's, you know, having a space where people can find a way to do that is like really nice. So yeah, um, I think that's probably about the time we have. Uh, um, I'm just gonna, before we finish, I wanna do um, a couple like a uh, little uh, lightning response questions. Got it. So just like, you know, one sentence, max two, but just like, you know, figure it out. So um, <clears throat> what's, the, uh, what's the hardest thing about running a tea company? Oh, uh, it's very new. And so you always have to educate. Mm. Yeah, you always have to educate. Very few people are coming in here with, uh, you know, pre-existing knowledge of the subject. Very cool. Um, what's the most fun thing about running a tea house? Drinking tea with people and going to China and sourcing tea. Nice. That's my favorite part of the job. Uh, what's your favorite place to go in China? Ooh, I love Guizhou. Chengdu is always my like Laojia in China. Mm. And I love Guizhou and of course I love Yunnan. So mm. the Southwest, I'd say. The South, very broad yeah. answer, but the Southwest yeah. of China. I like that. You had four answers and you're like, but it's only one. <laughs> I like that. Um, uh, la uh, last couple things. If, uh, if you had only one type of tea that you had to drink forever, what would it be? Shampoo. Shampoo. That was fast. Yeah. It was fast. I like type. that. I like that. Um, and then let's see if I had any other questions. Um, uh, what advice would you have for people that are just starting their tea journey? Have fun. Have fun with it. And you're not going to offend my ancestors if you, you know, <laughs> mess it up and you do it wrong. And yeah. Uh, yeah, enjoy yourself and share it with people and just yeah. follow your, your passion and your enjoyment of it. Nice. And I assume you mean your Jewish ancestors as well. So the yes. L'chaim. Uh, my L'chaim. My L'chaim. There we go. Anyway, so uh, thank you again. Mm. Uh, thank you again, Sohan, for uh, not only being on the podcast, but inviting us to use your space to be able to host it and to, for hosting all these other people as well. And um, I just want to thank everybody who came and showed up for the live recording of Tea Time with Jesse. I'm Jesse. We'll see you next time. There we go.